All right, so let's get ready to get started. So um, we are going to start with the second talk in about a minute. I just want to remind everyone to uh, send, uh, we don't have a Slido uh, for this session. So if you have questions, you can either send them uh, to the uh, Zoom chat or to the Discord chat or uh, raise your hand at the end of the talk. We're going to have 15 minutes uh, for the talk and then oh, five minutes for the question. Is that time? Yeah, 15, 15, five. Yes, 15 minutes for the talk, five minutes for the questions. <laughs> Uh, so I would like to introduce um, Thomas Lukens for the first talk, which is uh, Modes Analysis of Prediction Games. So it's up to you. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here um, in this uh, wonderful university, very beautiful place. Um, so this is uh, Modes Analysis of Prediction Games. Uh, by myself, Tom Wilkins, and my advisor, uh, Dr. Jordan Pollack, uh, with a demo lab at Brandeis University. So, um, a little ba a bit of background. So, we're going to be working with coevolutionary algorithms here. Um, and the difference between that and a traditional evolutionary algorithm is that interactions occur between different populations as opposed to just having some fixed fitness function. Um, we're going to be dealing with organisms with a genotype of some sort of labeled hetero heterogeneous graph as representing some kind of abstract machine. Uh, this could be a neural network. In this case, we're going to focus on finite state machines. Um, and also, the kinds of interactions that we're interested in here um, are, broadly speaking, cooperative and competitive. Um, and, uh, and when we have these different populations, they can make up an ecosystem with a particular topology. And so we have an example right here where you can see the orchid mantis preys upon certain species of moth, which has a more or less mutualistic relationship um, with species of orchid plants. And you can see interesting phenomena such as them evolving um, to share certain phenotypic characteristics. Um, some other terminology, um, we have a complexity metric, so we're evolving complexity here. So some function of an individual's genotypic uh, or phenotype. Um, and we're going to focus on genome size, and uh, we're also focused on open-endedness as a broad concept. Specifically, we're going to be looking at complexity growth. Um, so this is the case where the average complexity of organisms in the ecosystem grows reliably over evolutionary time and exceeding any sort of genetic drift. Um, so high level questions um, have to be asked about this sort of thing. Uh, can we reliably induce open-ended behavior in artificial systems? Uh, there are many different systems um, shown exhibiting certain aspects of open-endedness. Um, we're focused here on this growth of complexity over time. And we also need to think about how could we put this to practical use um, in digital systems, artificial systems, and how can we use this to further enhance our understanding of the natural world? And you can see some examples of some um, ecosystem topologies right here. Um, so you have two population models um, with the com competitive interactions, cooperative interactions, and we're also going to be looking at some three species models. So these are a little bit more complex. Um, the domain that we're going to be studying here is the linguistic prediction game. Uh, this was introduced by another of Jordan's students, uh, Nicholas Moran, um, in 2019. Um, and this is a game similar to the iterated, iterated prisoner's dilemma. Um, it's a bit simpler, even. Um, so it's an iterated game and where at each time step, um, your agent is going to emit a bit, either a zero or a one. Um, there's going to be two varieties of the game, cooperative and competitive. In a cooperative game, each is basically rewarded for matching or possibly mismatching bits. So there's a symmetric reward between each of the individuals. Whereas in a competitive relationship, the rewards are asymmetric. Uh, you begin without information about the identity of the other um, or the type of game that you're playing. So the sort of game that you're playing needs to be inferred through the information and interactions that you have with your partner. Uh, we're looking at organisms defined as finite state machines, uh, deterministic finite state machines, DFSMs. And you can see an example here on the right of a traditional schematic view 
of some FSMs uh, where we have labeled transition links and labeled states. And so the bit is basically the, um, the label of each state, which then prompts the transition of the partner. And you can see a dynamic representation of this game. The yellow indicates the current state. Um, when it's shaded, that indicates a state or link that hasn't been traversed yet. And so starting at the beginning, you can see that trajectory of interaction building over time until a loop occurs when they both return yellow on that first state. In this case, both would get a score of 0.5. So the final reward is that average score over the loop. So we would be just looking at those steps right, right before that um, loop occurs. Um, so in uh, Nick's work, um, he used a, a simple set of experimental conditions. Um, this is a pretty traditional coevolutionary setup. Uh, small population size, only around 50. Um, organisms starting from a single state. So we're starting from a minimal state and trying to see what conditions lead complexity to grow over time. Um, there's asexual reproduction uh, with four mutation operators. So you can add a state, remove state with equal probability, um, redirect a link, and then flip the label of a given state bit. So on the whole, there's no bias to grow, but there will be a tendency to grow over time because you're bounded at a size of one. Um, there's all versus all interactions. So each member of the population plays against all 50 of its um, opponents and its respective groups. Uh, we use fitness proportionate or roulette selection, if you're familiar with that from more traditional evolutionary algorithms. And our complexity metric, which we're using, is a count of the number of states in the genotype following a structural minimization procedure. So we're using Hopcroft's algorithm. And you can see here our results from Nick's original paper. You can see the control group has a gradual growth. Cooperative group, two species cooperative, is similar, whereas the competitive group is more of a flat line. We're also going to be looking at the three species mixed, which was proposed to have open-ended tendencies, especially in the mutualistic group, which we'll be looking at in more detail in a minute. So, um, so there were some hypotheses um, that Nick proposed in the original work that were difficult in order to verify just due to the nature of the organisms. Um, these are finite state machines. Over the course of an entire evolutionary history, you're dealing with millions of machines. Um, he, he evolved them for 100,000 generations. Um, and so it was difficult to sort of quantify um, or verify the hypotheses that he had in mind. Um, so let's take a closer look at the two species cooperative group. So this is after 50,000 time steps of evolution and a reproduction that I did of his experiments. Um, if you're in a two species cooperative group, you can see that double arrow on the end. Um, you're incentivized to be as predictable as possible. You both are rewarded. If I say zero, you say zero, we both get a point. Um, and indeed, if we look at the dynamic visualization there, even though there are many states, the actual interaction is only two time steps long. Both emit a zero, both enter a loop. And so that growth around it is actually a result of genetic drift. So this contrasts with the two species competitive group where we hypothesize organisms should behave more unpredictably to avoid being trapped by the other. So we can see here in that interaction trajectory at the bottom, there's a longer and more elaborate interaction. Um, what's interesting also is that the complexity size is tightly bounded below 25. And so the hypothesis that Nick had was that convention chasing or cycling phenomena was responsible for this cap on growth. So it's something inherent with the domain. Now the three species mixed was the most notable entry in the group um, where it was hypothesized that we saw open-endedness, some sort of open-ended characteristics of the system, in particular in the mutualist species. So we could think of that as being like the orchid in the prior example 
given before. But when I was doing reproductions of this to try to verify, I noticed that the episodes were very short, even relative to the much, much smaller machines in the competitive group. So even though this machine on the right, the mutualist, has over 150 states, its interactions were only six time steps long. So this led me to hypothesize that the bulk of the growth could in fact be a non-adaptive byproduct of the evolutionary process. So to test this, um, I decided to use the modes toolbox um, introduced by Emily Dolson and Anya Vostenar, the uh, measurements of open-ended dynamics of, all, of, all, of evolving systems, um, which is a set of tools and techniques to try to pin some simple metrics onto a hypothetically open-ended system. So we use a persistence filter to screen out neutral clades and maladaptive lineages to only focus on the adaptive lineages that persist over time. And then the second main component is an adaptive pruning step in order to prune those existing genotypes into the elements that are most essential for fitness. So we used our own heuristic. Um, so this is a fitness preserving heuristic um, that used genetic recency. So we start from the most genetically recent and then prune back from there. And then we use the modes metrics to those persistent pruned individuals in order to get a set um, of information at the end, which gives us a rough sense of the open-ended characteristics of the system. So change is one metric where the idea is we're looking at each of these checkpoints and seeing of those adaptive individuals, how many of them are different from those at the checkpoint before it. Novelty checks to see how many individuals have emerged that have never been seen before. And ecology is, is just the Shannon entropy, which gives a sense of how spread out um, those members of that group are. So is there one type of organism that dominates the group, or is there a more diverse ecology? So, um, so taking a look, we're just going to focus on the change in novelty metrics first for the two species ecosystems to check the hypothesis that convention chasing or strategy cycling was occurring. And so um, we can see that there's a slight rise and increase among the control and co-op groups, uh, which I hypothesize is that as they grow, the space of possible novelties tends to increase. But we notice, especially looking at those pink lines, that's when we apply the adaptive pruning to the cooperative group, which dramatically reduces both change and novelty. So of that big organism before, with only two time steps of interaction, all of that bloat wasn't necessary for it to perform in its environment. So when we prune it adaptively, it shrinks down to just a couple nodes. And so that's why we have that much, much lower metrics. Now, in order to test the hypothesis, um, we check the slope of novelty and change against each other. Oh, sorry, that's a bit in the way. Um, and what we find is that there's a negative slope in the novelty group that's statistically significant, whereas the novel, whereas the change metric of the of the competitive groups is relatively flat. So, in the modes toolbox paper, this is evidence of cycling behavior, which gives some support for Nick's hypothesis. For the two species complexity, this is the most important result. So the green group is that, um, oh, whoops. Oh yeah, yeah. Two species complexity. Um, we see that the cooperative group um, shrinks way down, which was what we believed would happen before and that the competitive group is actually more complex once the adaptive pruning procedure has taken place. Yeah, now this was the most important one. In the three species complexity group, what was hypothesized to be the open-ended group, the three species mixed, the green line at the top graph, once we apply adaptive pruning, 
it drops way down to the pink line. So almost flatlined with roughly equal complexity as a competitive group. So this gives evidence of um, non-adaptive bloat in the organism. And that's supported if we look at the episode lengths. So just to wrap it up, got one minute left. Uh, we see cycling phenomena are present in various ecosystems, um, which supports the hypotheses um, that Nick had before. Um, it does appear, however, that the bulk of mixed ecosystem complexity is non-adaptive. And so there still is a question of what is responsible for this growth that exceeds the control. Um, there's another um, domain uh, which I introduced at A Life last year, the collision game, which did appear to exhibit um, some open-ended growth that was resilient to adaptive pruning, but the modes toolbox is much um, much more focused scrutiny, and so we want to see whether or not it stands up. Uh, we also have a generalization of the game, the continuous prediction game, which needs to be implemented and tested, and also. The idea is to analyze the evolutionary trajectories. And so we have a prototype of a uh, dimension reduction technique using graph neural networks in order to map out the trajectories. So this is actually built using those same finite state machines, starting from, you can see the genesis point at the far right. As they grow over time, they're biased to grow synthetically. You can see they sort of flow through this pipe in the space interweaving around. So I'm going to talk more about this method at the lightning talk at the emerging researchers of A-Live on uh, Wednesday. Yep. So that's all. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let's uh, check more questions. So if you can have a question again, uh, you can ask on the Zoom. We don't have any questions on the Zoom right now. And also not on Discord. So how about in the audience? Would anyone in the uh, audience would like to ask a question? All right, so I want to ch check a little thing about the understanding of the talk. Sure. Um, in some parts, you're talking about open-endedness of behavior and others of open-endedness of growth. Mm. Here, when you measure open-endedness, you're yeah. talking about the complexity of the organisms, not yeah. the complexity of their behaviors. Correct. correct. So in this case, we're strictly looking at the complexity as a simple just count of the number of states in the genotype mm -hmm. after some variety of pruning technique has been used. I have done some preliminary experiments on the phenotypic behavior um, using epsilon machine reconstruction. Yeah. So a measure of you know the complexity of the time series of the results in, um, in the collision game, an analogous domain, which showed that the more complex ecosystems did have a higher, you know, more states in the epsilon machines afterwards. So there's some preliminary evidence, but that has not been tested in this domain. Okay. I have a follow-up question on that, but let me just check. Uh, anyone in the audience has a question? Oh, yes. Uh, so can you give it back? Uh, would you mind saying your name before you ask the question? Thank you. Hey, thanks for the talk. Cool stuff. I'm yeah. uh, Sam Rill from NYU. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering, so you were asking what mechanism drives growth to exceed control. Um, so yeah. first, just from my understanding, like, are you talking about kind of the bloat of the finite state machines uh, that, that you end up with? Um, and if so, is that is that just perhaps some kind of like uh, evolutionary drift? You know, yeah, yeah. yeah, so the working theory right now, and this needs to be um, tested, hopefully using that, the evolutionary trajectories, but that there's cycling behavior um, between the um the the parasitic group right in the in the three species mixed ecosystem we have that opponent and they're going to be cycling in a manner similar to the two species competitive mixed which is going to drive the cooperative group to adapt and so the the working hypothesis is that adaptation requires an addition of states or, or doesn't require the ones that do add states closer to the node will be rewarded with continuing to survive. But again, that's unclear, right? That, that, that hasn't been proven. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's the idea. Yeah, thank you for your question. Okay, cool, thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, 
we have we have time for one more question. In that case, I would like to give you another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would like to invite that to start setting up for your talk. All right, so I would like to move to the second talk by Steve Asia Vitu Japar from uh, Nagoya University. Uh, we'll talk about how excessive relativism can facilitate the evolution of morphology and behavior. So please uh, go ahead. Thank you very much. And good morning and greetings to everyone and chairperson. So I am Siti Asia Jafar from Nagoya University in Japan. And today I would like to um, give a bit of a talk about our research in our lab, which is how excessive elitism can facilitate the evolution of morphology and behavior of artificial creatures with needs. Okay. So I would like to start my presentation by briefing about some of the backgrounds of our research. So as we know, the approach to evolve artificial creatures is um, known to have a lot of interest in both scientific and engineering research. So in scientific research, such as the study of evolution and development of artificial creatures, while in engineering related research, they are more interested to show the purpose in robotics and manufacturing. Okay, so therefore, so our interest um, is in evolving artificial creatures by considering several concepts of eco evo -divo, that increase the interactions between multi-agents in our environment, um, also in a 3D physically simulated environment. So, however, by having all of these um, various factors, it actually had caused the increase in the evaluation cost to evolve uh, our creature, both in a physical simulation, and this is not negligible. So therefore, um, the reduction of evaluation costs in the evolutionary computation has actually been discussed quite widely. And by adopting a small population size is often used as an ad hoc way to resolve the problem. But it can actually cause premature convergence to happen in, in the evolution of creatures. So what are the possible solutions to these uh, problems? So by looking at existing studies, so many have implemented elitism in their evolutionary algorithms. So each of these studies that, uh, that I've shown here has modified 
uh, have their own modifications of elitisms in their algorithm. So by having these methods, um, the best individuals from one generation are carried over to the next generation unchanged, and which can improve the performance of the algorithm. So, however, uh, sorry, the role of elitism in reducing the evaluation costs has not been um, exclusively discussed. So in this study, we propose a simple method that we call excessive elitism, EE method to increase the size of the population by keeping the evaluation cost small. So why we increase the size of population? Because we want to contribute to prevent the population from premature convergence by having a higher diversity. So we modify elitism in hypernate, which is the uh, evolutionary algorithm used to evolve the genotype of artificial creatures. Okay, so how we apply this method is by succeeding and reusing the fitness values of the elite individuals in subsequent generations. And this method can be used to reduce the evaluation cost if the elite size in the population is in excess. So in this study, we use um, in evolutionary framework of artificial creatures in a 3D multi-agent environment based on Python. So our creature initially consists of um, one rigid body, rectangular shaped block that undergoes morphological development by addition of new block by joints and hinge. And the behavior, as you can see, is uh, uh, generated by the movement of the hinge in each of the uh, body body parts. So we are using hypernit. So hypernit is uh, the evolutionary algorithm commonly used to evolve a more complex uh, neural networks represented by um, CPPN. So this is uh, a little bit more um, into the uh, morphological development of our creature. So using hypernit to evolve the creatures. So the genome in each of individuals have their own genome, which is known as the CPPN. So um, at this stage, at the morphological development stage, so the CPPN firstly computes um, the morphological development of creatures by taking the inputs of the coordinates of the blocks and the output is by uh, is the addition of new blocks or not, the length, the, the direction of the hinge, and whether the hinge is fixed or flexible. And after that, after morphological development happens, so the CPPN this time, the same CPPN this time computes the weight connection of the behavior generation network that decides the angle of movement, movement of flexible hinge by considering the input uh, from the radar sensor that is uh, obtained from each of the blocks, the purple node. And so the behavior generation network over here consists of three layers, input, intermediate, and output. So each of these nodes in these layers are taken from the, the actual 3D substrate space. So the output of this network is the angle of the flexible hinge. So by using a simple locomotion task, we conduct experiments to see how our method can affect the evolution of creatures in this environment. So creatures were arranged in a circular, man circular manner surrounding the target cube at the center. And the fitness is the total distance traveled by the creatures. So the excessive elitism method that we apply in the algorithm was proposed by modifying the elitism in hypernit as mentioned before. So which is commonly defined as the best fit individuals in each species will be preserved as is from one generation to the next. And the elite individuals in the original hypernit will be re-evaluated in subsequent generations. So the difference in our method is that the best fit individuals will become elite from the whole population and genotypes will be passed on to the next generation. 
and uh, elite individuals will not be re-evaluated. The fitness will not be re-evaluated and carried on and used as their fitness in next generation. So by doing this, only ones that needs to be evaluated at each generation are the non-elite individuals, which is a minority when the elite individuals are in excess. So we conducted four cases to test our method. So first we assume a baseline case is BC, which a small population is often uh, used due to the strong limitation of the evaluation cost. And this case may face premature convergence due to a really small population size. So after that, for further investigation, we experimented case EE. So case EE is uh, we increase the population size and we apply our method, which is excessive elitism method in this case. And after that, we uh, carried out case LP, which is uh, have similar population size to case EE, but we did not apply our method to case LP. And finally, we demonstrate our method in a small population size which is similar to the baseline case. So let's look at the results. So this is the results that we have collected from all of our cases. So the first graph on top shows the average fitness of the population. And the second is the average block number of the creatures. And the last one is the trajectory of the uh, best uh, population from each case. And result shows that. So in case in the baseline case, the fitness is uh quite low, so reach around twenty and uh and occur premature convergence. So the fitness increase in case EE when we apply our method has improved very much and reached maximum value of sixty in many trials. And however, the evaluation costs between these two cases are quite similar. So we expect that case EE have a higher diversity due to the larger population size. So this had affected the morphological evolution of the creatures as well to be more adaptive and more simple and able to reach the target. And after that, we compare case EE and case LP, where our method is, does, does not apply to case LP. But we maintain the same population size. So we can see that the average fitness of case LP has dropped very low and faced premature convergence. And the evaluation cost for this case is also five times larger than case uh, EE due to the larger value of evaluating individuals. And we can see that the creatures are poorly evolved. They have too many body parts and uh, they are unable to reach a target, maybe, uh, maybe due to the congestions. So finally, we conduct case EESP to demonstrate our method in a small population size. So we can see that the fitness has uh, slightly improved from the baseline case. And the evaluation cost also dropped about half than in case BC due to the small number of evaluating individuals in this case. So this slide show shows the morphological development of each of the best individuals from each cases. So the distinctive forms of creatures from all of these cases show that different parameter conditions for uh, the cases can induce the evolution of a different morphological development and result in a different behavioral pattern. So we can see that the average number of blocks increase about 10 to 15, which is complex morphologies. And we expect that exists tendency of evolutionary uh, tendency that the individuals with larger number of blocks tend to dominate initially but those individuals were too complicated to evolve, to evolve further to obtain better morphological structures. 
which has also brought about premature convergence in the cases in with the small elite size. So instead, our method of excessive elite size has kept the diversity in the population, which allowed the individuals with smaller number of blocks to survive and to evolve their morphology and behavior to be more simple and adaptive. So finally, um, as observed from the previous result, we can see that evolution of creatures performs best in cases that we apply the EE method. So in addition to previous experiment, we want to find the optimal values of elite size and um, to successfully evolve the creatures in this environment. So we carry out experiments using different values of elite size, but we maintain the evaluating individuals to be 18 based on the previous experiment. So from the results, we can see that the cost has ranged from only 120 to 160, which is not a, a big difference. So we can see that the average of best fitness is the highest in case five, even though the cost is the highest, but the cost difference is not significant from all the other cases. And however, in case six, we expect that this case will be the best, but uh, the average fitness slightly decreased. And we suspect that case six may have extremely large ratio of elite size to evaluating individual size, which potentially leading to premature convergence due to the evolution of only the lowest fitness individuals. So as the conclusion, we propose um, this method to improve the evolution of creatures by increasing the population diversity and enables the population to avoid premature convergence at a small evaluation cost. So additionally, our method uh, shares uh, a little association with the quality diversity approach like MAP Elites, which captures a diverse high-performing solutions by partitioning the search space. So in this study, EE method, our method demonstrates the simplest means of securing a niche and maintaining diversity within general framework of simple genetic algorithm. So uh, we hope in further investigation, uh, we want to realize the potential of our method in a different and a more complex um, environment. So. I'm very honored for this opportunity to speak. So thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Uh, fascinating talk. Um, so we don't have any questions or Zoom in Zoom, and not on Discord. Anyone in the audience? Yes, sir. So just just uh, the microphone is coming to you. Hi. Can you hear me? Thank you for your talk. That was great. Um, I'm assuming that evaluating one of the individuals, there's some stochasticity. So if you evaluate the same genome twice, you might not get exactly the same fitness result. In the graphs that you showed of uh, fitness over time, did you reevaluate the genomes many times to get their actual fitness rather than the lucky value that they might have been exploiting when they were chosen to be an elite? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. So yes, we actually conducted about 20 trials for each of the cases. Yeah, so and we take the average values of each of the trials. So that's mm -hmm. 20 evaluations of one genome or 20 simulation runs? Um, 20 simulation runs, but... Uh, um, yes, for each of the trials, we run it for about 400 generations. Yes. Um, do you, okay, do you see the question that I'm getting at? So, so, I, think, I think what he's asking is, for each individual, if you, mm -hmm. if you evaluate the same individual two mm -hmm. times in a row, you might have different uh, fitness. Is that, is that included in your simulation? So we conduct a simulation at, as a population of genomes. Yes. So I'll yes. follow it up with mm -hmm. you, because I think there's an interesting balance there. But... Um, I mean, were you quite, were you surprised at how having such a huge proportion of the population uh, just in the elitism uh, function, were you surprised how successful that was? That seems surprising to me. Yes, that is actually quite surprising because we use a large 
rally of elites in our population. Yes. But maybe due to the modifications that we have in the elitism itself, maybe that is improving the average fitness. Of the Thank you. Thank you so much. I actually, I have a question about the elitism. So one thing that I observed, and I'm not sure if that's correct, this observation, but it seems that when you have a large amount of elitism, because you're evaluating all the individuals at the same time, when you're evaluating fewer individuals, they don't interfere with each other so much. And when you're evaluating a lot of individuals at the same time, they are interfering with each other. So is this improvement because of the elitism or is this improvement because the individuals are not interfering with each other too much? Did you investigate that? Thank you for the question. Uh, I think that if you use a larger population, uh, from, from my understanding, if you use a larger population, it uh, acquires more interaction between creatures, like in interruption between creatures. So I think in our environment, if we use a large population, it will actually cause congestions. Yes. So if we didn't apply our uh, the large elitism and Congestions will happen, like, for example, in case, sorry. yes, in, in in this case, yeah. So, uh, that that that's that answer is your question. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe we can talk about it later. But yes, yeah, that's sure, it. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, thank we don't have time for. Um, okay, I would like to. Call the the, fire, the the last speaker, uh, Austin Ferguson, and Charlie Opria. Potentiating mutations facilitate the evolution of associated learning in digital organisms. All right, cool. Uh, and let me know, I have people from MSU. Please tell me if I'm holding it too close or too far. I don't know how to use a mic. Um, I feel like I'm on a podcast. All right, so like Klaus said, my name is Austin Ferguson. Uh, today I'm presenting my talk, Potentiating Mutations Facilitate the Evolution of Associative Learning in Digital Organisms. Uh, and this was done with my PI, Charles Ofria. Okay, let me move the little box. Cool, okay. So I really want to talk about the first two words, the potentiating mutations side of things. So really what this talk is, is what is potentiation? Um, I throw in some results at the end, but really it's just me explaining these so that at this conference we can then talk about what I do uh, because having that common vocabulary is super useful. So, okay, to describe potentiation, I'm going to use an analogy of robots playing board games. Okay, so we have two robots. I'm going to call them red and blue. Uh, you can probably guess which one is which. And they're playing a nondescript, definitely not trademark game with some money. And, you know, it looks like a, a property card, but maybe not. Um, but so we have these two robots, and they're going to play against each other in a board game. Okay. These robots are deterministic. And by that, I mean if you have a state of the game, it will always map to the same action. Um, so if that same game state comes up multiple times, it will always result in the same action. However, the game itself is not deterministic because you have dice, right? You're always rolling to see how many spaces you go, okay? So we can imagine that these robots play some number of games. Um, here, you know, we just say in games, um, and we can tally which robot wins, or, you know, how many times each robot wins. So for this example, Let's say that the red robot wins 90% of the time. So clearly, overall, a better strategy than the blue robot. Okay? But what I'm interested in is what is happening in the 10% of replicates where the blue robot won. Right? So maybe it's getting really lucky with its dice rolls. You know, maybe it lands on the boardwalk space. Or I can't say that. But the, uh, you know, the, the really really useful space really early on in the game, and that gives it the competitive advantage that it needs to win overall. Okay. So when we think about these games, uh, and again, it wins, let's say, 10% of games. If we want to think about how, you know, what happens when it wins, 
we can break down a particular game. So let's say it won five games, here is one of them. And we can think about the game as a set of states. So state zero is nice and easy. That is, you know, you've followed the instructions, you've set up the game, and now you're ready to go, right? So every time you start a new game, it's going to be the same. Okay, but then we can transition between states. And that's going to involve a dice roll and an action from one of the robots. So let's say red goes first. So that takes us from the initial state, state zero, to state one. And of course, this continues and they take turns, right? So then you've got the blue uh, rolling the dice and taking an action, red, yada, yada, yada. Okay. But what we know is that at state zero, blue has a 10% probability to win, right? Or at least, you know, empirically, we think that is the probability that blue will win from the get-go. However, what is the probability at the other states? So let's say two dice rolls in, is blue more or less likely to win in this particular scenario, right? So we're still going through one particular set of states. So to do that, we could replay the game. So all we're doing is saying, we're gonna, re we're gonna do some more replicates. We're gonna have the robots play the game more times. But instead of starting over here at state zero, we're gonna start at state two. So this is, you know, they're wherever they're at, they're on the board, they have however much money, um, they're starting from that condition and going until the end of the game. Okay. And if we do that, then we could start to look at how does the probability of winning change between the initial state and the other state? Um, and just to clarify, this is a toy example. They probably have not done this well by state two, but they could, right? Um, so we could imagine if they have a 10% chance at the beginning, but then at state two, they are now going to win 60% of those games. Something has happened to really sway things in the favor of the blue robot. We might not know what's going on, but something has happened between these two states. And I'm going to claim, because I was using the word potentiation in my title, um, that state two is more potentiated than state zero for blue to win. And by potentiation, I'm just saying, you know, we have some probability of an outcome happening. And potentiation is my umbrella term for that. That way, if we're talking about different instances, um, it's still potentiation. OK, and this is an evolution section we should probably pivot to evolution. So we've been talking about board games, but we could apply these same techniques to evolving populations. So here we see a sequence of states. Um, you know, these are different time points, let's say. And these states are some summary of the population. So maybe you can completely take a snapshot of the entire population, or maybe, you know, the representative genotypes. It is some way of, you know, um, marking the state of that, or state's not the right word to use there, marking um, what the population is doing at that time. And then we also need the transitions. And in evolution, we have uh, mutation and genetic drift and you know, chance events from the environment, adding these stochastic random features. Uh, and then we also have selection that acts more deterministically where better, uh, better performing individuals are expected to reproduce more often. Okay, and I use this for the back of my let's pivot to evolution slide. Um, because I'm not the first to do this. Um, I definitely did not think of all of this. Um, so this comes from the Rich Linsky lab at MSU, um, where you know, they're evolving long-term lines of E. coli. Uh, specifically, they're evolving 12 lines of E. coli, 12 different populations. And they've been doing this for 30 years. One of these 12 lines has evolved to metabolize citrate. I am not a biologist. I don't know the details of what that means. Um, but you know, in their little flasks that they evolve in, they can now metabolize a different substance, which gives them, you know, they're more fit, right? Because they can better reproduce themselves. Well, what they did was, oh, spoiler, sorry. Um, so they started to ask, well, how did this citrate metabolism come to be, right? Was this a fluke mutation or was it something in that population that made it more likely to evolve there than in the other 11 populations? And thankfully, E. coli are really cool. Um, as bacteria, you can freeze them and then pull them back out later and revive these samples. And that's exactly what they used for this experiment. So uh, the actual experiment was Zach Blount and collaborators in 2008, but I'm stealing their review figure here because I think it's really nice. Um, I'm moving my little title bar. Okay, so you start with some ancestral clone. So the 12 evolving E. coli lines were you know, effectively all from the same ancestor, and then you've reached some outcome. So in their, uh, in their case, the outcome was 
citrate metabolism. And they said, okay, so we care about this particular lineage, how this population changed over time, and we have these samples. So what if we took these samples and revived them and then checked to see, you know, if we do these, uh, these replays, uh, they call them analytic replay experiments because they're reviving these, evolving them for some amount of time, and then seeing how many of them reach the same outcome. And, and here are their results. Um, so on the y-axis, we have the mutation rate to citrate metabolism. And then we have these are like little box plots. Um, we have the ancestor on the left and the potentiated clones on the right. So these are farther along in that lineage. And when we look at these results, they did see that it is much more likely for citrate metabolism to uh, emerge in these potentiated clones, which sounds great. That makes sense. Uh, but it was cool to empirically see this. Okay. And then in comes the work that Charles and I did. I've only talked about other people's stuff up to this point. So we were doing some work in Avita, um, which, if you're not familiar, is a digital, uh, a digital uh, evolution system uh, involving self-replicating computer programs. And I'm not going to give the details. They're little like linear GP things, if you're familiar with those terms. Um, but they're just little, little programs doing their own little thing. OK. And um, the domain that we were doing or were using for this work was associative learning. It's a very simple setup where we put those little uh, we put those little evolving programs on a spatial grid, and we can see so like you know here's an example grid on the side, and depending on what tile they're on, they have a queue. So for example, the, the little blue circles are oh you need to go forward you're going the right way, and that queue is always locked at a one. However, if you walk off the path, um, you hit one of the X's, which is a negative one. So these cues tell you what you need to do to follow the path. However, this turns into, ooh, I got really loud. Um, however, this turns into learning when you uh, incorporate the turns. So the left and right cues um, are random. So you, know, some, um, you cannot genetically encode what is a left and what is a right. You can encode an algorithm to deduce that and store that, but you cannot genetically encode the turns themselves. So there has to be some learning or associative memory going on. OK, so then for this work, we were like, OK, let's do some replays um, on this associative learning domain and see how potentiation changed throughout the lineages, which is similar to what Zach did, but a little different. So we ran 200 replicates, and only 8% of them evolved learning. So it's a pretty rare behavior. If you start from scratch, from that default ancestor, you're very unlikely to evolve learning. And we can look at one of those. So we ran 200 replicates, 16 of them evolved learning. If we look at any of those 16 uh, lineages, we have, again, a sequence of states. And this is, again, the representative genotypes of our population at different points in time. Same thing as before. So what we did was we took all these states. Um, we went up through state 1000. And we said, let's do these replay experiments at intervals of 50 states. OK, so this was so Zach's work. Um, which was wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I won't talk bad about it. Um, but when you're messing with bacteria and you know biological organisms, actually getting them to evolve takes a lot of time and a lot of hours in the lab, like doing transfers. And you know we're a little bit easier with the uh, the computational system. So we're like, we'll just do a complete sweep of every 50 steps. And what we find, um, and just to orient you really quickly, um, here you're going to see several of these plots. The x-axis is the population state. So we're starting at the ancestor on the left and going out uh, through the lineage toward the right. And on the y-axis, we have the percentage of replays that evolve that associative learning behavior. OK? So what we see is, of course, they start at that 8% mark. But then over time, this is a successful lineage. So we expect it to, you know, it evolved learning. So we expect learning to become uh, more likely over time. And specifically, we have this window. So from state 400 to state 500, we see potentiation increase pretty dramatically, right? which was cool um, because you can imagine several situations uh, where maybe it increases pretty slowly or you know, maybe it's more like a step function. We really didn't know going into this, right? So then what Charles and I said was, well, this is cool, but what if we did it at a finer scale? So we can go from the step 400 to step 500 and replay evolution at every single genotype you know, in that window. So that's what we did. Uh, so now we're looking at effectively individual mutations to this lineage and how they change the likelihood that uh, learning will evolve. So 
same type of plot, again, from say 400 to 500. And we see that it's almost kind of step function. So we see, you know, one pretty big jump in potentiation out here. Um, again, these are only 50 replicates per point. So there is a good bit of noise, um, but especially where this dotted line is, you know, that's a pretty, you know, pretty substantial jump in potentiation. Um, even with the noise, I'm comfortable saying, you know, that one was a big deal. So this was a single mutation that was making learning much, much more likely to evolve. We're going from 30 some percent chance that learning evolves up past 80 some percent. So, you know, this was pretty, this stood out to us, right? So, you know, with a single mutation, um, we can see learning becoming much more likely. And so this was one lineage uh, for this A-Life work. This was really a case study to see, can we do this? Does this make sense? Um, so here I have two plots. So this is a second lineage. So we did four in total. Um, and we see similar trends, right? So this is uh, the every 50 steps. And we see another window of really sharp increase. And then when we zoom in on that window, we see some gradual increase, but still, at, you know, that one mutation there in the middle um, that is conferring that large increase in potentiation, making learning more likely. And, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these, but we also see the same dynamics in the other two lineage, lineages that we analyze. Um, even in this one, where there's quite a bit of noise uh, in the zoomed in window, but overall, you know, we have this one step that is a big deal, right? So, um, I don't have time to get into all the details of what's going on with these mutations. So we try to dig into them a little bit uh, because like two of them were neutral. One of them was beneficial and one of them was deleterious. And, you know, the beneficial mutation I would love to talk about because that blew my mind because I was expecting, you know, you're, you're already pretty fit, but you're on a non-learning phenotype and you have to like lose some fitness to then reach uh, learning. But in that case, the most important mutation was still beneficial. Um, so there's a lot I want to dive into here. Um, but takeaways overall. So again, my main thing was to talk about potentiation. My friends hear me talk about this all the time, and they're probably super tired of it. Uh, okay, stop shaking your head. That was good. Um, we can use these replay experiments to measure potentiation. And the novel contribution of this work was just that this potentiation can arise suddenly, because this was the first time we could do it at a scale to actually look at individual mutations and their effect. Uh, and future work, um, which is also just, you know, the remainder of my PhD section. Um, more lineages. You know, this is four. This was a case study. Um, we want to do some like actual real statistics and stuff like that. So we want to do more work in that. Um, different organisms because, you know, Avita is one system. Different tasks. Associative learning is really cool and I like it a lot, but there are plenty of other tasks that we could be evolving. And then finally, starting to do some comparisons between, oh, Avita has, you know, these changes in potentiation but this other system has these different changes. Are they similar? Are there patterns of potentiation or not? And that's it. Thank you so much. And I'll take questions. Fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and Austin, uh, let me just double check the Zoom. So, okay, you got like a great talk uh, comment on Zoom. Uh, so anyone has uh, any comment, any questions? Oh yes, up there in the top. And just a reminder to please introduce yourself when making a question. Hi, uh, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, when you talk about the rise in the potential and you say that's uh, some sudden rise, mm -hmm. uh, that's very huge. And did you, are you planning to do any uh, statistic analyze to see does this arisement follow some distribution? If they follow some distribution. Ooh, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, so that'll be in the, the future work. Um, so like the next paper, right? So this was the four lineages. The next paper is let's do 50 lineages and then we'll have a lot more data to do that. And that's one thing I absolutely want to do is to say, hey, let's take all of these different mutations and just, you know, just plot the distribution. Let's see, you know, are these just freak outliers way over here um, that are causing these giant jumps? Or, you know, are they fairly common? You know, what kind of distribution is it? Um, I really don't know what to expect. Um, early results, it looks like these real these large jumps are pretty common. Uh, but most of the other mutations, as we saw, aren't going to do that much, right? It's mostly just noise um, around a, a fixed point. But yeah, that's a great idea. Um, absolutely plan to do that in the next the next paper. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very curious about that. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Sit back down, Cliff. What are you doing? No. <laughs> <laughs>
Hi, Cliff. Somebody's got to ask you a hard question. No, it's not a hard question. Oh, that first that first history that you showed had a had a steep decline. Steep decline. Uh, yes, I know which one you're talking about. Right here. Like, yeah, at 480. So I'm I'm curious if you have the ability to look at the resulting high performers and see if they followed the same path or if they they went down a different path because it's. It, it, it looks like it actually lost potential before it made its final big discovery. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's something I would love to do. I'm not sure how to do that, right? Like, how do you compare phylogenies to, I mean, if they followed the same exact path, yes, that's pretty easy. Um, but like, how do you do the analysis to say, oh, these were pretty similar, like they took a pretty similar direction, but they had differences in the details, right? Um, if somebody knows how to do that, please let me know. That would be amazing. Um, but that is an analysis that I totally agree, right? Um, and also, we want to look more into the drops. Um, that one is sizable enough to matter, but also with the noise and stuff, I'm not sure how dramatic it actually is. Um, but we'd also like to, so we were looking at um, lineages that evolved learning overall. There are also plenty of lineages that didn't, right? And we could check to see, hey, did learning, was it potentiated in the middle of the, the lineage and then drop off? Um, things like that, especially with uh, lineages that evolved behaviors very similar to learning. Um, I would expect to see some pretty sharp declines. So, yeah, absolutely. I really want to look more into it. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, great talk. Thanks. Oops. All right. Thank you, everyone. And that brings us to about the end of the session. So I would like to ask for a final round of applause for all the three speakers. Uh, and thank everyone that is following online as well. And I hope you have a great rest of the conference. Bye-bye.